I'm Ilsa Connect, and I'm the Deputy Director of Public Policy for the National Center for Victims of Crime, and I'm also the Director of our DNA Resource Center. I welcome you to today's webinar, uh, Stopping Rapists in Ohio by Testing Sexual Assault Kits. With our speakers, I want to go over just a few housekeeping issues with you. Everyone who entered the call today is on mute, which means that we will not be able to take questions uh, but we will take them through using the question and answer tool, which is down on the right bottom side of your screen. You can any time during the presentation, but we won't answer questions until the end. If you have technical issues and you need support, please call WebEx support, and the number is on the screen, 866-221-3239. Say that we uh, thank our supporter, Thermo Fisher Scientific. They have supported our DNA Research Center work for over seven years now. And our is brought to you through their work, and they are longtime supporters of of our work on forensic DNA. The DNA goal is to increase awareness and understanding about how we can use forensic DNA technology to more crime and bring answers to victims and prevent more crime by maximizing the potential of DNA. Our center has been very much involved in ensuring that rape kit evidence is being handled responsibly and fairly across the country. We did, uh, with the support of the Department of Justice and Thurl Fisher, for communities who are working in their old untested rape kit problem and information about working with victims and handling these old cases. I want to of the national centers focus on rape kits called the Rape Kit Action Project, or RCAP. Our partnership between the National Center, the Rape Abuse Incest Network, and Natasha's Justice Project, and our mission is to promote policies and laws that are accountability for the processing of rape kits. Interested in working on such legislation in your state, please feel free to contact me, and we will work with you legislators in your state. We could provide provide technical assistance and information to support those goals. And the Department of Justice support conducted many webinars, um, and trainings, and we've developed materials about forensic DNA and using DNA in many different kinds of crimes for victim law enforcement professionals to work with victims. We have more than 30 archived webinars on our website. We have full victim notification policies, all kinds of shoots and legislation related to untested rape kits and um, collect DNA, and we have. Uh, statute of limitations chart and some information about using the exceptions to prosecute these old cases. Site for the DNA Resource Center. Um, you can archive. You can access all archived webinars from this, this website. And this is my information. If you'd like to connect about forensic DNA, or if we can help you by providing any technical assistance, Twitter, our two accounts are there. The Every Kit Counts uh, is for the Rape Kit Action Project. Now on to our speakers. We have Prosecutor Rick Bell from Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office, Criminal Investigations Division Chief in the Office of Cuyahoga County Prosecutor Tim McGinty, and Paul DeSanto, Special Investigator of the Cold Case CODIS Unit in the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. Cases they have been solving amazing. To, to those of you who are working on your mission to test old rape kits, they have learned lessons in Cleveland and here they are today to share them with you. So, Rick, the floor is yours and thanks for being with us today. Thank you. I'd like to introduce to everybody uh, Nicole DeSanto. She's here with our office. She's a special investigator. Nicole? For having me. Uh, thank you. And Thank you very much to the National Center for giving us this opportunity. We've been good partners with you, and uh, we uh, take it as that we've learned from your conferences and from the speakers that you've provided us here in Cleveland, Ohio, and we've grown our task force. So special outs and thank yous to Dr. Campbell and uh, Detective Rita Markey. We appreciate everything that, uh, that we've learned from everybody so far. 
this is uh, our emblem, obviously, and what we uh, want to remind everybody where Cleveland, Ohio is, up here on the lake, uh, Brownstown. Uh, our county is Cuyahoga. That's crooked. That's a crooked river, Cuyahoga County. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, events that uh, we've been working on. That we'll, but one of the things that we wanted to explain is that we're very good partners with uh, the Attorney General's office here. Our goal is Mike DeWine, and he tests all of the rape kits uh, for our office and across the state uh, in-house. He doesn't outsource. All of this is done with the confines of one laboratory uh, at the which is designed specifically uh, for the testing of these rape, rape kits. The Justice Center on the ninth floor, where we and our street, so we're moving to a new location where we will have all of our detectives, all of our investigators and agents, and the entire task force in one place on one floor on that top floor that you're viewing now is our elected prosecutor, Tim McGinty, and we're grateful for uh, his vision and for the, the Attorney General's office. Now that I'm both follically and vertically challenged, so I have to make up for it with a lot of hard work. Uh, the team, the prosecutors are Max Martin, Mary Weston, Denise Salerno. These were the original three hires into the unit, started the task force February 20th, 2013. Had three investigators, and that's a picture of Nicole DeSanto from her prom, I think, uh, on the <laughs> left, and uh, Tim Clark and Sahir Hassan. Uh, additionally, we added Cariolo and Deshaun Thompson. Nicole is our office now for how many years, Nicole? Uh, almost 11 years. As an investigator, Tim Clark is a former Cleveland police officer. Sahir Hassan as well. He was a detective in the homicide unit. Ken Riola, a FBI agent. Deshaun Thompson worked for a suburb here called East Cleveland. Recently added other investigators, uh, temporary hires for the next two years based upon money that our county council has been willing to provide to us. Uh, we went to just recently and they've uh, approved it yesterday uh, for an additional uh, eight people in order to accelerate the process and get done with things faster. Uh, Dan and Bill on the bottom there are former uh, chiefs of police and others have been investigators working for police departments or our office or uh, the embedded within our office, which is something that we learned as a, a lesson learned early on, Maria Simmons and Janine DeCola. We are working currently with Rape Crisis, who has an intern in our office, to make sure that all of the referrals for advocacy all have a referral directly to rape crisis for counseling to follow up on all of uh, that work to make sure that the victims are being heard that we are uh, victim centered in our approach here and these advocates kind of keep the investigators and, and the process uh, update with what's happening uh, with the day stresses uh, that are placed upon victims because we're bringing up these old cases. So supported by Linda Quinn and Tony Sestarsik, they're the intake people. When the laboratory gives us the positive DNA results, they're placed into a management system, which immediately then can be shared by all of the investigators and prosecutors together. And so a uh, of the reports in, and Cleveland police have been uh, to allow us to have access directly to their RMS system uh, so we can pull down reports and work with the police department. But it is embedded in our office. The lieutenant, James McPike, is a sex lieutenant of their unit, and the Cleveland Police Department joined the task force in September of 2013, a number of months after we were up and running and had some initial success. And those detectives from their unit that had already been trained and already been working sex crimes, uh, so bought into the system, and they are uh, supporters and uh, are very good uh, workers. They work side by side with Nicole. Nicole works with Aaron Johnson quite a bit. Uh, as our teams, we attempt to make sure that our our, our police officers, uh, detectives that you see here on the screen, are working together. 
uh, on there to, uh, to make sure that we have a, a nice homogenous uh, working relationship task force can survive. As you may know that listening in here, task forces uh, oftentimes don't survive for a long period of time. Uh, we've uh, received some, some information on how to make a task force last longer that we want to share with you. This is also involved. Bureau of Criminal Investigation, which is uh, in, in the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General is testing lab uh, rape kits for us, giving the lab results, and they're providing investigators here in order to help us accelerate the process. Uh, they've announced uh, providing a $450,000 grant, so we may hire an additional six agents. And we've named one of their agents, Dennis Sweet, as the lead investigator over our investigators. In January of 2013, uh, was that we started thinking about creating a task force, and we created actually February 20th of 2013. After months of working cases, we had to work very quickly due to our 20 year statute of limitations that was back to March 9th of 1993, there were the cases that we had to indict very quickly with our prosecutors and with the three investigators. A little bit of question. We Jim McNamara, Retired Behavioral Analysis a Unit uh, uh, with the, the FBI, to do this of our project, and he said for the Task Force last, we had to have one physical location, and we embed the police immediately to the office in that physical location and have, have them work in the same rooms that our investigators and other victim advocates were working. Enjoyed a very high cooperation rate with our victims. I firmly believe it's because our advocates are part of the notification process. The victims are met, if necessary, at their houses, uh, and they're all met here. And we give them rights. We provide laptops and printers to our investigators, and our kids uh, assist the investigators in that notification process. So the counseling that we've been able to provide them with the victim advocacy, uh, they in touch with us and they stay cooperative. And for the most, on almost every single case, we've enjoyed full cooperation with them after uh, we encourage them to participate uh, in the prosecution of our, our case. In this, the urgencies that we made in front of you, uh, those two advocates have the meeting rooms and hire the three investigators and prosecutors that we spoke of, and the project manager who would be a lead over the attorneys and the investigator. We create take officers and we utilize the electronic case management, which allowed us to share cases with each other. We see the old detective files from the Cleveland Police Department. Cleveland Police were very helpful. They would put masks and go upstairs to the dusty rooms in the, where they would keep their old files uh, in banker records uh, going back uh, 20 years. They would have bank uh, banks and would have to physically go through them, and they were willing to do that. Eventually, we decided they we would need to have a, a scanning process within the project, and we scanned all of their old detective files and cataloged them sequentially. So we need to get to any sex crimes case in the past that we would be able to look it up without having to send the police uh, back up to the dusty uh, room where those are kept. We have a agreement immediately with the Attorney General's office, a handshake to provide us with four investigators, and they did, and had an agreement with to test the oldest cases first, as uh, at first they were not testing the 1993 cases, we needed to make sure that we were getting those first to their statute of limitations. And then we agreed that once we create a little bit of a cushion to start working the old cases as well to squeeze them in the middle, but to do that in case there's any serial rapists that were out there that were still active, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Cleveland, uh, where I told you Deshaun Thompson uh, works, and we went into a outside of their uh, police department, an old 
trailer that they had refrigerated and kept all of their rape kits. We had 800 of those rape kits, 200 that had not been tested for DNA, uh, and we of the lab uh, and the director of the lab, Mike Elton, where we went there ourselves, got in our jeans, brought our law clerks, and we actually went through each and every lab kit and made sure that those kits were uh, were all tested. Uh, we made sure that we had a contract with the Cleveland Police Department. That if you're dealing with any metropolitan police department, oftentimes they'll want to sign off on MOUs, and we did that in September of 2013, and gave us the four uh, workers. Uh, and we supplied them with four temporary evidence prep technicians to pull off the rape kits off of their shelves. How many? 4,400, as it turns out. A lot of work that had to be done to make sure that they were submitted properly and the chain of custody was, uh, was taken into account. Uh, everything had to be typed, sometimes on an old typewriter in order to make sure that uh, the reports were consistent uh, and, and consistently kept. So long story there I won't get into, but we had did create a victim notification protocol with our advocates and with rape crisis, and then sure that our our, our victims were, were receiving counseling. The lessons that we learned is many of the victims on these we are investigating really want to have advocacy. They didn't want to have counseling. They had moved with their lives were helpful to. to have the cases investigated and tested, but they feel that they needed counseling and their support system. Well, we learned pretty soon, and they did as well, that uh, that, that was not the case. Uh, open old wounds, you need to have a counselor that's already created a relationship with the victims early on. So we did a pro protocol where the rape crisis would be informed make a handoff directly to rape crisis counselors uh, in case the victims didn't fact or later if they didn't want it immediately. This was our estimation to begin with. We found another 400. We knew the DNA profile hit rate in, in our lab was 50%. So we'd have to investigate 2,000 cases, uh, cases per investigator if we had the 10 investigators. And then we decided that we would need to because it would take us five years to complete the project if they were working uh, at a 40 cases per year. We determined about nine months into the project uh, how fast Nicole and everybody was able to clear their cases, and this held true. It was about four cases per year uh, from uh, to end. Uh, to complete the project with 12 investigators, uh, with an estimated 2,200 uh, investigations, would be November 7th of 2017. That was able to our elected prosecutor, Prosecutor McGinty, because in the meantime, uh, the thought was that these rates that are as before might strike again. We did a audit, and we've determined that there's over 600, possibly closer to 700. That are out on the streets at any given time, uh, people we've identified as having positive DNA, but are out and they're not incarcerated. So that's scary we thought. We knew that we'd have to accelerate. Every day this comes out, it's published because it's tied into our case management system that the investigators uh, uh, put the, the details in and our intake people as well. So, uh, so far we've and there are complete 184. We have another 129 left. And we still have lab reports and cases that are being done uh, that are coming back in. So we anticipate another 600 to 700 more cases that we'll be receiving. Of our indictments, we have 229 people indicted so far. There is actually seven does that we've indicted. And we'll about that. And then we keep track of our dispositions as well, how many people are being convicted, what's our conviction rate, which is at 90.8% now. Our uh, 
uh, trial conviction rate as, as well, seeing a, a great deal of success. The 22 cases that have gone to trial so far, we have 16 of those cases. 4.7% uh, conviction rate right there. So, right, and we think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the victims are very credible. If you're willing to prosecute now, 20 years, 15 years later, then surely they must be telling the truth. And that's the persuasive argument uh, to give to, uh, to a jury, uh, that these people that are still here, still coordinated, they're justice before, but looking at now. And they are bolded and empowered because they know that DNA is on their side. Uh, they are, in many of our cases, we found that, that there might be other victims kids uh, uh, are matching uh, together. If you look at the blue here, it says 166 of our uh, of our cases here have, have more defendants. We have 166 defendants, more than one uh, that they have raped. 14 uh, that have a uh, oh, defendant, I'm sorry, that has 14. And you see, we have many that have two or three. So a lot of these serial rapists, people who are more sexual convictions, have actually had a consensual uh, as well as a stranger case, identity defense. So 51 of these 166 have is an acquaintance but all have a case where a victim is so the victimists are out there. They'll rape people now and they'll also go out there on the street. And one of the things the boss wanted to do to explain to the legislator, our county council, uh, attorney general, uh, how much harm it was being created to our, our residents here in Cuyahoga County. Is there a way to quantify of economic harm has happened to our victim and to the criminal justice system because people weren't prosecuted for the rape years ago when they when they could have been? Study the National Institute of Health study that does act uh, victims on the different types of cases: murder, rape, assault, robbery. And they were able to then look up each of our 229 defendants and determine how much loss to the system, to the victim, both tangible and intangible, uh, there would be. And of, uh, an estimate here that's very conservative of $122 million because of the criminal convictions that have occurred after uh, conviction. So if they had been played, they could have investigated and prosecuted. They would have caused those other those other crimes and add up. And that's very important uh, for both Republicans and Democrats who are uh, fiscal and you the argument that you're harming the community unless you investigate these cases. We create a uh, chance for our investigators, a 12 step process of the things that we as prosecutors would need. And we can make that available to anybody. It's something that we've used here. It's to have the dates there and a checklist to be able to check them off because that can be used by the grand jury prosecutor. It can be used uh, as a summary sheet for testimony later. And it's a, it's a one-page synopsis, essentially, of everything that the detectives need to do when they come uh, and prosecutor that they think they have a case that's ready to be prosecuted. We need to speak to the victim. We need to show a photo array. We need to confront the defendant. We need to get the records. So that is kind of our checklist. And now, all this is electronically put together on a work that I'm sure will It's still time consuming, but we found that it's working well, keeping everything in line of what you need to do next. Nice about it from a manager's perspective is you're able then to see exactly how long it takes your investigators to do any individual steps and where 
that we might need to give more resources to, to help them. And in fact, uh, the Attorney General has provided us now not only with a lead investigator, but an analyst and the other investigators. We're going to use the analyst to help the detectives and investigators by all of the paperwork that needs to be collected, uh, leads reports, all of the medical records, curants, and TLOs that need to be run in order to find your victims and find your defendants. Uh, the detectives can actually spend more time with the defendants uh, in interrogation, leading the victims and um, their statements. And, uh, and that's all part of our acceleration plan. One official case, the one that first came in, there was a, a person uh, that we believed, and the Attorney General believed, his name would be Rand Spivey. This was back in January of 2013. Point, the Attorney General's office brought two Cleveland police reports, one from a, of a girl uh, and another uh, in 1993, and another of a stranger rape of another in 1996. The victim uh, was a key, uh, key home from school, and she was doing well, and the offender of, of her actually came in. He knew her mother. Son, and he ended up violently raping her, and she immediately reported it to neighbors, and she went to the hospital where her rape kit was stored. 1996, an unknown male raped a, a woman walking home from a bar at East 55th Street. His sins disappeared, but our offices had a lot of success in prosecuting these cases when we put them together with another victim's case, and we introduced the medical records. Uh, was a lifestyle back then at that time. She had a number of boyfriends. It was during the church uh, in Cleveland in the early 1990s. She was of the, uh, the person that she believed his name to be Randy Spivey. So the looked for a Randy Spivey. Uh, they could find a Randy Spivey in this general area. Uh, uh, for when the Attorney General brought this case to our attention in January of 2013, and the prosecutor's office could not find a Randy Spivey using all the new technology that's available for people to look up people's names. But anybody within a within a of the street where in fact uh, rape. find a couple of spiveys, although their first names didn't begin with R. We gave it to the victims and we asked them to identify. And the victim and her mother could not identify them. And then we decided perhaps he's already been deceased and we looked at the medical examiner's office. Uh, but that's not the case either. So we did with having to do something before the statute of limitations run investigating or researching, I should say, the different cases that have brought John Doe indictments. And one of our counties, a different county in the state of Ohio, had actually done this in Montgomery County in the early 2000s. And so we decided that this was the first case to do just that. Now we have 73 John Doe indictments, our first John Doe indictment. And as you can see, we put in all of his uh, DNA markers and uh, we've been able to win every single one of these challenges upstairs uh, in court. This was the first motion that he filed that it should be uh, out of court because we did not properly identify him before the statute of limitations run. And the case is on your side if you choose to indict on John Doe indictments. Within two months, June 18, 2013, of this hit to the 1993 case and 1996 uh, case to each other, came back to George Young. Uh, R. Young is spy the, the opposite for Randy. So we looked at his record and we found that he liked 
to go to trial. So he had been acquitted on a number of crimes, 83, 84, and even after the 1998 CODIS went into effect, 2003 and 9, the Tsar knew that he was going to be placed in CODIS if he was convicted at trial. Because if back then the law was you, once you're convicted, you were placed into CODIS. Now, 2011, most states uh, would take your swab upon arrest, just like when you fingerprint you. So most states have the for the police officers to do that. They're definitely advocating that all arrestees uh, be swab because it would prevent uh, this sort of thing. One of the we do tell our prosecutors now, if somebody's was going to trial a lot to try to be acquitted, it's very possible that they were to avoid the CODIS system. Did uh, in 2013 of this felonious assault. That year should say uh, 2008. Talk about another uh, uh, Cleveland case. So before I move on, Nicole, you had helped us a lot, quite a bit on the George R. Young case on, with the other interviewers. Yes, I received a hit saying that uh, our John Doe was George Young. We were confused on that there was a uh, Randy Spivey. I spoke to the prosecutor who handled the uh, felonious assault case that got George Young swapped to uh, and that he went by the name of Randy. And Randy was obviously his middle name. Also admitted to me when I confronted him. So we had the correct person not only by DNA, but that he went by that name. Okay. And the indications are, have been very fruitful. A lot of the uh, information that we see, receive as prosecutors, it's been the, the, the case when somebody is denied knowing someone or raping them. So one of the first things that Nicole and the other investigators do is to provide a, a, a photograph of the victim to the person that they're interrogating. And oftentimes they'll say, I, I don't know that person, I never had sex with that person, and I'm right at right there on the uh, on the photograph and something that uh, uh, occasion I think of uh, of our prosecutor at the time was Brian McDonough if you're out there Brian hello and uh, he kind of educated us because he had been to a game, uh, in Baltimore where all of that was uh, was mentioned so that was one of the lessons that we learned from other places and we put it into effect and it's worked out very well this year September 2nd 2000 14, a very brutal rape, a stranger rape that had taken place, and this uh, could not be solved. We did our best to try to find out who it was. The police uh, could determine uh, who this stranger rape was. It had uh, at this location. The van is on the other side. You'll see a wall there. There. Doe, uh, who had been born in 1967. In the early morning, at 5:22 in the morning, he runs up to Starbucks and then we'll have a coffee and then run back. So it's her rape. Perhaps might have known who she was. He struck and he did use a condom. Uh, was her thoughts? That's evidence behind. I'm going to show you still shots now. We're not going to show you the the, the video. But it was caught on camera, and if you look. Uh, lights are on the left and uh, towards the street, you'll see a shot uh, from very far away uh, of the offender uh, down the uh, the rape victim who was walking or jogging at, at, at the time. He reminded her and the camera picked all of this up. He launched himself at her and he grabbed her from behind and he took between the cars that are behind her and then the building where that alleyway was that, uh, that we looked at on the screen. Briefly, that's the area, uh, where the little stone wall is. The police did ask the left to, uh, to if they could. And when it's negative, uh, that's when the police ask the victim whether or not it would be okay to to the public. Public and the media, uh, all of the uh, TV stations, and the the with the victims uh, uh, 
people wish to look at large, and nobody could identify who that person might be. That with our investigators and with FBI, and we asked uh, uh, the subject to report dump uh, at the tower there at 522 in the morning. We figured it was a bad time or a time when there wouldn't be much activity. And we got because the person that the uh, one come back at that same time to the Tyson Williams. We didn't know uncle was the rapist or uh, Tyson Williams after he, uh, the uncle was, uh, the uncle said that the cell phone actually belonged to his nephew. The sheriff deputies and the investigators from our office fanned out to quickly look for other cameras so we could hopefully get a picture and show that to the public. Camera locations that we were able to find. Most cameras are within 10 days. In fact, most within five days. So if you ever want to get cameras, you need to have your investigators mobilized quickly. The offender walking on Lake very close by to where he actually committed the, the rape. And as you see, there's something bright in his hand. As it turns out, it's the cell phone. And Jason Williams had placed a call to him that the phone that was there back up from that tower dump. Walking up the sidewalk, the victim uh, is far up the street, right in the middle of the street where it's nice and light bushes and the sidewalks and the, the darkness. And uh, he waits for her behind uh, the bushes here where he's walking up the drive until she runs and then he runs after. Corner uh, takes uh, after her. The victim in the middle of the street uh, way up to the upper right hand side uh, where the tree is and then runs further down, uh, he starts taking off after her. So, uh, in nearby cities, this that, that rape took place. The victim was born in 1988. We did not really have a preference for a, certain, for a certain age. The rape was very brutal, but he, the main important is the third to the last bullet point where he stolen money from her pockets. The negative and we had a, uh, a meeting on that. Cole, why don't you tell them about uh, your thoughts on what needed to be tested? There? Well, we were able to determine that the rapist didn't find any sperm or DNA that was able to be found in the rape kit. It was imperative to see if there was any other cases he might have left DNA. In the first case that Rick showed you, we approached from behind the victim. So we had the uh, thought that he might have left touched on the back of the victim or somewhere where he might have handled her. In the case, like I said, he it was shown to those two victims of the robbery and they were able to pick out James Daniel. However, the Lakewood rape victim was not able to pick out the photo in a photo array. Uh, and therefore, we request the lab to, attempt to locate and detect DNA. They found a very minute amount of DNA in the pockets, they retested again, and, and found uh, enough DNA for enough to be placed into the CODIS system. James Daniel. Work is that uh, a commission by at the same time about one minute before the rape, and when the police execute a search warrant at the uncle for Tyson Williams, the man that owned the cell phone, they saw him in white Camaro there. So, whether or not Tyson Williams was the rapist or his brother James Daniels rapist, is it possible that Tyson Williams uh, was? Uh, using or 
wearing his brother's uh, clothes. We knew that would be the defense. There might be some contamination. So we rule Tyson in or rule him out, and we did that uh, by the uncle. So the old uh, is what's necessary on these cases. Just because you have DNA, we've learned it's not enough. You have a lot of work that still needs to be done. Marijuana charge uh, uh, house that we found a small amount of marijuana. Decided to put him in jail, and then went to his jail calls. And in jail calls, we were able to detect that he dropped his brother off, his half brother off, Daniel, and then came back from the victim's pocket, and we cases together. What the the Part of troubling for us that was opportunity uh, that is some uh, some benefits uh, for the project being investigated already in our office. We had just received a hit on May 19th for Daniel of an early rape that he had committed in the year 2000. So we had active that was working the case, and she was working it uh, hard. She was had trouble locating the victim because the victim was out of state and then was not showing up for his parole uh, hearings, parole meetings with the parole officer. So this earlier 2000 case uh, was all another uh, one that uh, we, in fact, been able to locate the victim and bring that case. Uh, we have over 600 cases that where our defendants are out on the street. This hadn't had any other sexual offenses between 2000 and 2014. So it's very difficult to put him on the priority scale that the next person that we need to pick up off the street. But the detective is trying to work the case as quickly as possible. But we've been able now to go back to our county council and go back to the attorney general and claim that it's really necessary to hire more to finish the project, not in five years, not in three years, but in a year and a half if possible. So we're growing the task force now up to 30 investigators to make that happen. And those are taking place now. This is the earlier shot of just how fast uh, the offender was run down the street before he took down the, our victim who was jogging in the street. after the uh, the rape had taken place and away. We held a sexual assault kit summit, summit between the city we felt were, that we had visited that were, were much the same way that we were. And our Memphis and Detroit uh, have the same approach to their rape kit testing. That forklift approach, as, as we've learned from uh, marking and from us, where you forklift all of your rape kits over from the laboratory or to the laboratory from the police department. I think retesting all rape kits to make sure that you have everything uh, in everything in the CODIS system. And in our cases, that rape kits had actually gone to the lab once, but only serology was done, and not a full DNA profile had been developed. In 2000s, the practice here, and as we're ter determining across many of the states, was for the labs to run the, the test. See, there was some biological evidence that could, in fact, be tested. So that the detectives know that yes, in fact, there is something here, and in fact, is needed to to act for DNA or to have a a, a, a suspect. They would bring a swab in when the testing would be done. The rape cap have a piece of tape on them in the property room that says that uh, it's been uh, reviewed by the last state. It doesn't necessarily mean that they've been tested for DNA. So what I'm attempting to do is to educate all property room managers for the police departments that they can look for the tape. They have to uh, determine whether or not DNA testing in Memphis, 
Texas and Detroit uh, have similar resource issues that we do and uh, the similar drive to want to make sure that the victims have advocates and in case be uh, So we've uh, agreed to meet at a summit where we do what our best practices are. And the and things that we agreed upon at the summit were to have a common name for our groups. So our task force here now in Cuyahoga County is called the Cuyahoga County Sexual Assault Kid Task Force. And we understand that Memphis, uh, as well as Detroit, have the same plans to do that. We, we would have to have a collaboration of, of funds that needed to be at the table in order to have a complete task force that is truly working with each other. That must include prosecutors, it must include law enforcement, police investigators, it must include the laboratories, it must include victim advocacy. When all the people that I've just mentioned are at the table together, you work together and you can accomplish a lot of things. If people are not there, if administration isn't there to oversee and make sure that the investigations are taken care of or are actually taking place, then you'll have a problem. One of the things we learned is that we shouldn't be policing ourselves. The police need to have uh, assistance from prosecutors. It's good to have county council involved. It's good to have city councils involved. It's good to have the mayor involved, as they are in Memphis, uh, where Wharton is uh, taking command for the, the executive branch, which the police are housed in. This uh, makes sure that everybody has confidence in the system and that every single case is not only being tested, but investigated as well. Uh, we consult with team part uh, always on our cases before we issue any media statements to make sure that they know. We do have weekly meetings and the other uh, tasks in the cities do as well. Which is a good thing to be transparent. In fact, in Cleveland, we embed the media at those meetings. They're welcome to come to the meetings to hear what it is that we have to say. Of course, they are embarked from presenting any investigation issues or investigative techniques, and if we have to meet privately on an investigation, of course, we do so. We also agree that the definition of a serial offender is two or more convictions of a sexual assault, and we'll want to collect data and information on uh, other things as well. We'll be talking about that and the things that need to be done in our office. We're going to actually hire uh, professors and from Case Western Reserve University in order to make some uh, assessment of what we have. It's an incredible opportunity uh, for sociologists and criminologists to take a look at, at, uh, at the behavior here of these practices as well as the criminal system itself. All kids, police, there are kids on their shelves, identify one main goal and to stick with that goal. Our here is to test and to investigate all of the kids from 1993 through 2009, which was our immediate backlog. So you'll want to get a task force with the people and the personnel that we talked about. The project here in Cleveland is a prosecutor. We have, in fact, learned that that is the best way for us to be able to make sure that the cases are reviewed for sufficiency of evidence. It seems to make sense to make sure that the investigator and the prosecutor are working together. We do have a investigator now, and we have decided that we need to be flexible. As issues we need to make sure that we can change course if we need to. And one of the things decided here is that our investigators needed more hands-on uh, management so they wouldn't have to find the prosecutor who are up in court now most of the time. Uh, we create an investigation priority utilizing a checklist. One that we enjoyed was the fact that we had a statute of limitations. Uh, it was our priority checklist for the most part, but that we've caught up on the statute of limitations. We have a way to prioritize those cases. Which offenders do we believe? might strike next, and so we are creating that uh, even. It's part of the notification process. By part of the notification process, 
uh, in these cases and by in counseling we to make sure that the victims stay with us throughout the course of the investigation. And that's why I believe we've been able to have 229 prosecutions uh, indicted to 299 defendants. And I think that's why we have such a, a high conviction rate right now. Uh, we should meet weekly with strong support staff uh, and that's needed initially to make sure that there's some center, some hub uh, that can take uh, grant. That's my arm, Linda Quinn, and then now Tony Sestarsik, another individual in our office, is very good at the intake in the organization and will help us by having an analyst on the front end as well. What uh, uh, MEMPS is doing is reviewing all of their negative DNA police reports as well. Of our 4,000 rape kits, 2,000 will come back with positive DNA. The other 2,000 will come back with no DNA, but we've found it very, very difficult to go back through those police reports to look for uh, signature crimes. Also, sometimes the defendants, uh, the suspects, were named suspects, uh, but they perhaps might not have been able to have been contacted by the police or perhaps might not have been a follow-up. And we were looking at those cases. We learned that that was uh, something Memphis was doing, and we're taking that into consideration. Uh, and lastly, maybe importantly, a lot of these are the rape kits now. So we need three investigators to handle the load. That's not the case. If we're going to get this done and get this done quickly, we would need 12 in order to finish within a two and a half year period. If we're going to finish it uh, within a one and a half year period, we needed to go up to 30. We were able to convince our funder, county council, that we're going to pay for the same amount of money uh, about the course of this. Do they want to do it quicker, or do they want to, to linger take a longer period of time? Nicole, do you have other things that you would like to say? No, I think uh, you've hit on most everything. Um, it is the collaboration, though, that that I think from beginning till now that I've seen makes such a huge difference. Um, the Cleveland Police Department, as well as the BCI investigators, the Sheriff's sure. Office, um, with different um, knowledge and different places to reach out to. So that collaboration has made our investigation so much easier. Thank everybody for listening to us, and we hope that some of this, uh, things that we've learned from other cities and from other trainings and practical experience might, might be helpful uh, to you. Great, Rick. That was um, a lot of information, and um, I learned I learned more than I, I have before, even from seeing you do this <laughs> once. Um, I have a, a couple of here I want to go over. Um, the last one. Oh, here it is. And you may have said this, but I just wanted to emphasize it. How many um, two hundred arose? How many kits? How many tested kits? Uh, one hundred and twenty are actually the cases that we that we indicted. Mm -hmm. uh, so oh, indicted. That, mm -hmm. Yes. And that, uh, so far, uh, out of thousand seven hundred cases that we've received. Uh, but we're not investigating those uh, those cases yet. So uh, they'll be in. Um, mm -hmm. We anticipate and project out that there'll be about 1,000 indictments in Kayahari. That 1,400 rape kits that are being taken off of the shelves of the Cleveland Police Department. Okay, you received 1,070. You mean you've gotten some information back from BCI about that? That That's right. So waiting for some of the uh, for some of the levels to come back, or much of them. And we're about a quarter done of our, with our project, and uh, one quarter finding 50% hit rate in CODIS, and we're finding that we're able to prosecute about half of those. So one quarter of the of whatever the full universe of rape kits there are, and that's because some of them have been prosecuted already, as as we found out. So we have a bit of an innocence project going on here with inside the project, not intended, but uh, we're waiting still for that case where a uh, uh, be tested and we find out that it wasn't the defendant that pled mm -hmm. guilty. But that's not happened yet. It hasn't. Okay. Happened. It hasn't happened. 
exoneration. Yeah. No, no, no okay. exonerations. But uh, if it's also part part of the process that brings evidence to the public, we're willing to take a look at those cases and test even those uh, those rape kits and the other thing if that, if that ever. Mm -hmm. Um, people are asking slides. I do want to say that the recording of uh, the webinar and the slides will be on our website. It'll probably take us a till early so you can go back to the DNA Resource Center and get those. Um, question about Jane Doe kits. I can't find the actual question right now. Um, but have you had any Jane Doe kits um, that you know, lab, and then you got any any kind of DNA hit on? We did, in fact, one. That it's just come up recently, and we're having discussions about uh, about that, how to handle that. You know, so the, the that can be on that. Many of uh, uh, many people seek treatment, and they seek treatment with anonymity because they have no they have to prosecute somebody. Uh, and so it's really more for medical reasons that they're seeking the the rape kit. So uh, it's difficult if we're being victim-centered to decide, uh, let's try to find out who that uh, that is and, and go from there. For the part, uh, our advocates, uh, especially year 2000, have been embedded in the hospitals themselves. So a victim is advised of their uh, um, and if they want to come forward to the police, uh, they could at, at that time. So it would be very difficult for us to go forward on any Jane Doe cases. Um, things that we would probably uh, have difficult not prosecuting a case is if it was a Jane Doe case that matched up to a serial rapist as well. We haven't uh, had that situation yet, but that's uh, when we, we ever do have that situation. Mm -hmm. That's we'll uh, we'll have to make some hard decisions there. Mm -hmm. The assumption is that the kids that um, most of the kids that are being sent forward or have been sent forward are from cases where the victims originally wanted, you know, and they their names were attached to the kids. So the vast majority of them really were kids that victims wanted to tested. Okay. And we we don't. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't even have a a number of the Jango kids. We receive the referrals after they go to the lab, mm -hmm. so we don't have. Uh, of which of the kits to begin with were Jane Doe kits. I only knew one because there was a positive DNA that came through, and uh, uh, in all likelihood will not be proceeding with that uh, investigation or prosecution. Mm -hmm. And there's about um, the age of the victims at the time of the rape. How many were, were juveniles, children, you know, um, when they were raped? Can have Nicole answer that, but we do want to collect the victim demographics and defendant demographics. Mm -hmm. and we do that with the Case Western Reserve personnel that will come in, uh, but we haven't to date collected all of that information. So it'll have to be a project to go back and enter in all of those uh, those fields. But Nicole, what uh, anecdotally, what do you think? I would say my best guesstimate of my cases is around. 30% were children. Uh, the youngest I've had is 12 uh, through 17. Um, but I had, I, I'm going to say probably 3% of my cases have been children and now are young adults deciding whether to go forward with this or not. Well, okay. The demographics when you guys have that, that all done. Um, I don't think there's any other questions, except for one person asked about the NIH study um, citation, um, and if you can you send that to me, I can send that out to the folks that participated. I don't know if it was on your slide or not. Uh, um, so we could do that. Okay. Um, and then the checklist that you mentioned um, as well. So we'll communicate that, and then everybody that, that listened to the webinar, uh, can, we can get that information out to folks. So it looks like that's it for our questions right now. And um, I just want to thank both of you for for giving us all this really amazing information. It's it's um, I think it's really helpful to other communities, and I'm sure that, that you're helpful as a resource as well. So 
Um, I have my contact information up here on the screen, and people can contact me. I can get you in touch with Rick. Um, I, uh, Cleveland is very interested in being helpful to other communities as they go through this process, and a lot more places discover their untested kits. So I think it's timing for you all to be putting information out there and be available. So I want to thank you very much for coming on today. And do you have any parting thoughts you want to participants right now? Um, yes, just that, you know, there's some hard decisions that have to be made. There are some elements or perhaps some administrations uh, for cities or prosecutors that are thinking whether they really want to roll up this and get in into this. It's been very worthwhile. We found out so much that before. The cases are connected. In a five-year prosecutor, I I've never think about your cases myopically. You don't see really how they're connected to each other. But it's through to be able to to be people that that you now out there are committing rapes. Thirty two percent of our cases uh one or more, I have actually more than one victim on them. That's a, a shame number. So if there's a way to get those people off the streets, you police or representing your county or the mayor or situation or council, you have an opportunity here not only to do right for those victims, but to protect from happening in the future. And if you can take those criminals off of the street and make your city for people back into downtown, people will start money. <laughs> it's a quality right. of life that raises, and there's a general safety and uh, economic good for all of us. So the big picture is uh, to take courage, and you have to be willing to, to take some of the shots that might come at you when you realize that some of these older cases could have been investigated, could have been prosecuted. And if you're transparent with uh, the media, if you're transparent with your public, and you take victims with compassion, you'll come out on top. Great. Really good parting words for us. So thank you, everyone who participated today. If you'll stay on for just a minute, uh, we'll see a uh, pop-up, a little uh, what's our evaluation. Thank you. Thank you about the webinar and that would be very helpful if you'd fill that out for us and then you'll see an email coming to you in a few days about the fact that the the web slides were posted online so thank you everyone for participating and have a great afternoon thank you